advantage. Hmm. Where's the control? Oh, there it is. All right. That's interesting. Somehow I got this thing to go away. There may be some way to do it without that thing on the screen in the way. Neat. Anyway. All right. So I've been through the schedule. Some way, what a list you put it down there. Move to bottom, yeah, all right. Bottom and top are my only choices. Oh, oh, no, really, I can go to the side. That might be less annoying, we're gonna see. All right, so. Oh yeah, that was, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, there we go. So I got one person live and five online. I thought this was awesome. We're, the universe exists, now proven. So uh, there was an argument that hit the, all the blogs and everything about five years ago, where a guy figured would most likely be in a simulation, but these guys figured found something in reality having to do with the quantum hall effect that cannot be simulated. Yeah. It, the complexity grows with the, exponential power of the number of particles. So a simulation would consume all your resources on any reasonable computer. So uh, the latest conclusion is that reality exists. I remember when I used to worry about this stuff. But anyway, all right, so uh, uh, the, I remember the FBI a couple of years ago got this uh, $1 million tool to hack into iPhones, and there were some Freedom of Information Act requests demanding to know how it works, and the judge has now concluded that they do not have to provide that information, and they aren't gonna on the grounds that it would make the phones less secure and diminish law enforcement capabilities and everything else. Yeah, I didn't really think they needed to. I mean, they bought it. For their, for paper. Well, yeah, well, uh, it's an interesting issue. A federal agency buys it. Do the news media have the right to demand it? And apparently not. You, so you have to decide these things in court. Like if you go through customs and they want the password to your computer, there are certain cases in which you have to hand it over in some countries. I, and that's the kind of stuff that has to go to court. So Google, had 4chan as a trusted source, which is pretty amazing. So it spread fake Vegas suitor news. Their robot, after enough uh, searches were for something unusual on 4chan, they took that as clue that something was really happening and put it as real information. Which of course, the whole point of 4chan is to troll everybody, so it wasn't. Um, this is uh, Nicole Perlroth, who visited here a year or so ago I, um, and gave a talk. She's the New York Times security reporter. And she said something today I'm still thinking about. She said, it's time to regulate Google or Twitter and Facebook the same way you regulate other news agencies, where they're just liable for what they say and they can get sued for it. That's what they do in Russia. They did? Yeah. Well, see, but so, the, so if a user says it and they don't censor it, they're considered to have said it? Yeah, they said it was time for you to be uh, either moderated and supposed to have a like this, like, to the request to provide IPO the person. Man, so they, they have to know. They have to moderate. So he's saying in Russia they have to moderate it, and they have to know who posted it. So did did they did they did they leave Russia? I mean, can they possibly comply with that? Yeah. Oh, so maybe did maybe they deployed a special version just inside Russia, like they know they did in China. That yeah. Google deployed a special version, and. I don't know, I imagine Facebook and Twitter would too if they could get in to try to obey their rules. Well, it's a big issue. And I think um, with all this fake news and trolling and everything, we're, we're headed to something like that around here. Where, but, that's, but if they were actually liable for everything everybody said, then they would I don't, then have to be the end of all forum posting and everything. You'd have to pay like $5 to post anything because they have to pay a human to read it and decide if it's true. Yep. I don't know. Yeah, this one's a, uh, like, 
together more is more effective. And then all regarding like censorship and the you know, and the plastic. And yeah. they just start enforcing it. So we'll see. Man. Well, you know, that's interesting. So they have, they have started enforcing it in Russia, so we'll see what happens. I know what most people usually say is that if you do something like this, everyone will just move out of the country. And the, that might be what happened. Put everything in some country that couldn't care less, you know, like Bangladesh or something. Host everything there. I don't know what the rules are down there, though. Anyway, so UK National Lottery got knocked off by a GDOS attack. I, I think this, I mean, unless I'm missing something, that just means they're idiots. There are free services like Cloudflare that will protect you from any conceivable DDoS attack. In fact, Cloudflare announced last week that they'll now protect you from anything for free. Because as I thought two years ago, when I last heard Matthew Prince talk about it, he said they can already stop any attack that the internet can deliver. So there's, so any, anybody that lets a DDoS attack take them down for HTTP content is just a damn fool as far as I can tell. Now, Cloudflare doesn't protect other kinds of content, like streaming media. But I don't know. Anyway, uh, so people have been snapping violet blue selfies, and that has been blocked by a judge. This is actually a big issue. I've heard about this all my life. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to sell and buy votes and otherwise corrupt the process, and they would like you to prove that you voted their way. And so it is illegal to make any record of how you voted. You can say how you voted, but you cannot make any proof, because then somebody, your boss could say, I'm going to fire you if you don't vote for Trump, and you'll have to bring in proof that you really voted for Trump. And so they, that's how they deal with it. It's a, you have the free, you have the right to record anything about your life, but not this one particular thing because it's related to our secret ballot, which is at the heart of the system, that you can always lie about how you voted and therefore nobody can really pressure you too much. That's the idea. We should have a voting machine. It should have arrived at my home today. Someone donated one to us at CactusCon. And um, so we'll have it here, a Diebold voting machine. And uh, we can try to suck the firmware off it and hack it and all that jazz. Let's see how much fun we can have with it. He told me that the firmware is on ROM chips that are soldered to the motherboard and cannot be updated without physically removing it. So that is a good sign. That means it's probably some really old version of crap and vulnerable. Um, so this, the Indian Bitcoin exchange, someone, they claimed they were the most secure Bitcoin exchange. This guy said, well, that's like raving a red flag in front of a bull. And he immediately hacked into it Burp. I used a standard burp technique uh, called cross origin, yeah, uh, cross origin requests or something. Uh, uh, yeah, cross origin resource sharing, which I don't quite understand. Something like cross site scripting. It's some web development stuff. Yeah, so it's some way, I think it's some way in which you add a resource from another page that's out, and then you, all you have to do is put a poisonous resource on that other page and bring it in. So he was able to uh, totally get into other people's accounts here. And he told them, and they didn't care, and they didn't fix it, so he just went full disclosure. So that should be good, clean fun. Um, so Bro is tired of their name. The, the Bro name, they decide, has some, sounds sexist or otherwise offensive, so they want new names. So you can contribute to the Bro Project by proposing a new name. I like their Bro. Something to say about that. What's that? Oh, of course, the, of course, yeah, Fortran should have bots making one million votes for something offensive. Yes. I, I propose do, but anyway, uh, all right, so let's see, we got another minute and a half. I found this thing today called CryptoMG. This is going to be in this class because this has got um, six cryptography lessons, and it's from the people that made SQLOL, which is pretty cool. And one of these you solve with hash extension, which is great. I was trying to write my own hash extension vulnerable, um, so they got one here, so I'm going to work on this probably by next week. You'll have some homework going through CryptoMG. And it looks like I can just put this thing up on my server, like Security Shepherd, and let people get in there because it's all mathematic, cryptographic errors and things like the cookies and the tokens that are supposed to be random. Um, and they reproduce real problems that have happened before. Um, somebody sent me this on Twitter, which is pretty interesting. You may have heard the, um, that we pulled our diplomats out of Cuba and the people our diplomats in Cuba were going deaf and getting headaches and hearing strange noises. And here's a paper from years ago, 2003, talking about how high radio frequency energy causes sounds. And they can get loud and they can do damage. And so maybe they're okay. running some kind of powerful radio near there. The yeah. It, any, any kind of powerful off radio. I mean, I used, to, um, I used to go to the top of San Bruno Mountain riding my bike. I went up there with my friend who was a ham. And they had these antennas that are like 100 feet tall. And it has a sign saying, it's unsafe to be near these antennas. And I said, radio? 
AM radio, long wave, but there is some limit of even that. I mean, it's much less dangerous than other forms of radiation, but in a high enough power, even radio is bad for you. I, uh, I hear you like you produce speech specific noises with like modulation. Oh, well, that would be great. You could drive people nuts or fake a seance or something, make spe spe specific noises. Yeah, they say it comes from like uh, uh, thermal expansion of things in your ear. So you can make your play your ear like a drum. I would imagine it has some awful effect, like cancer or something later. I don't know. But anyway. They are. Because of this, something's wrong, and they didn't know what, what it is, poison or fungus. Or I think I've heard that. Yeah, people are saying they're taking some kind of serious damage. So. Uh, yeah, well, I can understand that. I mean, it's it's not clear if it's some kind of attack or just some kind of unsafe condition. But anyway, you don't want that happening to people. Well, in Russia, they had a bug in the back of a seal. And then the ambassador was giving the radiation I don't know. I didn't. I don't know why you'd have to have radioactive bugs to the extent that it would hurt somebody. But, well, but maybe microwave, I guess. Uh, Wow. Well, I guess. I mean, just I think for audio for monitoring, you don't need to run any kind of electromagnetic radiation powerful enough to hurt people. But Lord knows, I mean, you have to make it about a million times stronger than it needs to be to really hurt somebody. But, but who knows? Anything could happen. So anyway, let's talk about block ciphers. I was pretty happy about this stuff. I learned several good new things. Um, so we're going to talk about these other modes. These things have been defined by the National Institute of Standards for a really long time. They're originally defined for good old DES. And even though DES was insecure from having a short key, these modes continue to be important. And uh, I'll talk about them, and then I'll have a little bit more arithmetic, modular arithmetic. So um, the point here is, as I mentioned before, if textbook encryption is where you have a block of input and the key and it goes to a block of output, and if you have another block of identical input, you get an identical block of output. And this is the worthless mode called electronic codebook mode. It is one possible way to use encryption, but it's a miserable way because it doesn't really remove patterns from the input. The patterns from the input are reflected in the output, and so it obviously doesn't achieve the goal of encryption of concealing the input data. <laughs> All right, so if you have, um, but there are a lot of ways to do this. If you have one um, have a block cipher, it could just work on blocks all the way through, in which case you're going to have to pad the data to fill the blocks, or you could use the block to create blocks of key stream, and then you could use XOR bit by bit on the key stream, and then you wouldn't have to pad it. And there are both options are available here. Um, and you can do more things there. But anyway, um, so here's the basic modes of operation. Electronic codebook mode is the simplest mode where you just have blocks of input, encrypt them with the key, every one of them is independent from every other. Uh, this has the advantage that it can be really fast. If you have a parallel processor, you can be doing multiple blocks at the same time, because you do not have to do block number one before you do block number two, um, but it has the defect that it doesn't really remove all information from the input. It low resolution data in the input is retained in the output, and that's a serious flaw. So these other modes are all attempts to fix that problem by somehow adding something that varies to every block. So if you get another block of identical input, some other thing is added to it or combined with it to change it so you don't get the result in the answer. All right, and so um, we'll go through them. So e electronic codebook and cipher block chaining are ones that require the block size to be to fill the block. The others don't because of the way they're designed which I uh, was very pleased to learn in this book. I never noticed it before. The math is done so that the last step is just an XOR with a key stream. So you can give them an incomplete block of text and you can still encrypt it with these modes without padding it out, which is actually a very good thing because padding can lead to padding oracle attacks, which is a serious security problem. Um, so your book has an error saying which three have this property, but it's the three that are not electronic code book and cipher block chaining of the big five. This one at the end, Galois counter mode, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, is a new one, and I'm not sure whether you have to fill the blocks in that case or not. So um, you can try them in Python. That's what I was doing. I thought it's good, clean fun. So this is the simp this is um, cipher block chaining mode. So we've done this last time. You make the key has to be 16 bytes, and you can't pad that or anything. So I made a one character plain text and a 16 character plain text. Then I give it an initialization vector because cipher block chaining does require an IV in addition to a key. 
make a new AES object and encrypt the plain text 16 and it encrypts it okay and prints out this garbage which is a mixture of hexadecimal unprintable characters interspersed with printable ASCII characters. So this is a pretty miserable way to express the output, but it did succeed. But if you try to encrypt just one byte, it crashes. It says you must have the, cipher, the plain text has to be a integral multiple of 16 bytes, which is what you expect for this technique. But if you try a, uh, CFB, um, cyber feedback, it'll encrypt one byte just fine, no problem at all. And if you try a uh, counter mode, it'll encrypt one byte. Now the other one that's supposed to be able to do this is output feedback, but it doesn't. And it says you have to have multiples of 16 bytes again, which I thought was pretty rude because it explicitly was not supposed to require that. So I looked into it. This is a known bug in Python. That that mode is supposed to be able to encrypt odd numbers of bytes and somebody who programmed it made a mistake and restricted it to full blocks. It's not really a property of the encryption. It's an error in their implementation. So that made me feel better. At least I understand what's going on now. So anyway, here's good old electronic codebook mode. You feed in plain text with key, you get a block of cybertext, and you just do that independently for every block of input. Um, very simple, easy to understand, but it, um, not so good because you don't have any randomness going in. And so if you decrypt it, you decrypt it the same way. You can block decrypts all by itself with the key. So encryption and decryption can be done in parallel. And uh, they just are nothing more than a lookup table. And that's fine. Um, so this means you do not need to synchronize blocks. If some blocks are lost in transit, the blocks that get there decrypt just fine, which is another problem with the other one. I worried about when I first heard about cipher block chaining, it means that if you make a mistake, it's going to ruin every later block, which is pretty harsh. Anyway, so if you have noisy channels creating some bit errors, it doesn't destroy the whole message. It only destroys the blocks that have a bit wrong in it. And like I say, it can be done in parallel processing. So you could use a GPU or something and make it much faster. Uh, so disadvantages are it does not really remove all patterns from the input. And if you send the same message twice, the attacker can see that. And this is actually a much bigger problem. Um, you know, there was a, quite a few research projects demonstrating this. One of the simplest ones was that if you wanted to see where people are surfing on the internet and you assume they're going to like the top 1,000 sites, you can just look at the patterns of sizes of the packets and you can tell where they're going even when they're using HTTPS and it's all encrypted. And so the same thing's true here. There is a lot of repetitive activity like loading the main page of Google is just a fixed request and ARPs are just fixed requests. So you could just do it, record it, and if someone's encrypting in this mode, you could spot ciphertext that matches the known ciphertext without decrypting it, you could still tell. So, you know, that's a problem. It just this is a miserable idea. If there's nothing random or changing block by block, then a whole bunch of attacks become possible that will eventually leak out your secrets. So another one that's cute is the substitution attack, and we did this in VERC um, last semester in 129S or maybe a year ago. Um, you can now have an electronic bank transfer. See, since you're going to encrypt stuff by blocks, and since parameters are sent up to websites as just strings of text, so I could send stuff to my account, send $1 to my account like 100 times, and then I could eventually figure out how this thing breaks up. And so then I could replace a block to just change the destination account of somebody else's transfer to mine or change the dollar amount of somebody else's because I wouldn't have to decipher the other blocks. I just have to manipulate one block and I can use my own legitimate requests to figure out how to encrypt that block. It's the problem. You know, it's like I can replace eight characters in a sentence. That might be enough to add not or other or something and totally change the meaning of the sentence. All right. So any other one which I showed you in the projects you should be doing is encrypting bitmaps. So if you use electronic codebook mode, the penguin just turns into this, which is not very good encryption. It still has a lot of information about the input left in it, which is not what you want. All right, so the, the mode that is more common is cipher blockchaining. And I wonder if there's a way to get this thing to go away. Hide? Not obviously. That green thing to go away? I'm just wondering, because it, it goes away sometimes by accident when I don't want it to, but I don't know how to make it go away. All right, well, such is life. All right, uh, all right. so cipher block chaining. Here's the idea, it's all chained together, so if you want to encrypt block two, you must first encrypt block one, and then use part of the result of that to add something to block two. 
And therefore, since you're adding something to every one, you might as well add something to the very first one, or otherwise you create a special vulnerability about just the first block, so you need an initialization vector. In addition to a key, you have an initialization vector, and both of these things are supposed to be random. The IV is not really secret, but it does have to be different every time. So you add an IV into the first block, and then you take the plain text and the key, and you encrypt it, make ciphertext, and then you take the ciphertext as the IV for the next block, which is then combined with the key and the plain text to do it again, and on you go. So now um, every block depends on both the key and the previous block. And that has the result of completely scrambling the data. In order to decrypt it, you have to carefully do it all backwards. Um, you have to decrypt the first block with the right IV, I guess it's still forwards, and then, ex and then use that to get the next block and that to get the next block. So both encryption and decryption are approximately equal amounts of work and they are um, sequential, and they cannot be parallelized. You cannot do block two until you've done block one, you can't do block three until you've done block two. All right, um, so if you try to do a substitution attack, and you change the IV for every wire transfer, then it will never work, because none of the samples you collect are really representative of any of the encryption of the target you're trying to modify. Every, if you do the same request 100 times, you'll get different ciphertext every time, and so will the person who's money you're trying to steal, so that's good. Uh, you do not need to keep the IV secret, but it has to be unpredictable, so that I can't predict what somebody else's IV is. That's all. All right, so that's one way to do it. Then there's output feedback mode, and really, this amounts to just moving the order of the operations about from cipher block cheating, but it has an interesting result. You take the plain text and the key and the initialization vector. Well, you take the key and initialization vector and you make a block of what you could call uh, um, a stream, a random bit stream here. Then you XOR with the plain text. Then you take the output of that and the key. So this is like the IV in the next block, and you make another block of random bits, which is XOR with the text. So see, down here, I just have plain text being XOR with, some, with um, this key and this key. All you're doing is making an endless key stream here. So this has the result that I don't need to fill the blocks because I use the encryption routine with feedback to create pseudo-random bits, and then I just XOR the bits with the ciphertext. So if the ciphertext ends here, I can just take that many bits to the plain text and XOR it in, and it doesn't matter. I don't need to have blocks anymore. It's just the order of operations is such that I do something to create a stream, and all I'm really doing here is XOR every byte. You still have to do them in order, though. You can't parallelize it because you don't know how to create that block of, of pseudo-random bits until you've done the one before it to get the IV for it. But still, it's cute. And so decryption is similar. Um, all you do is create the same block of bits and then XOR it again. Decryption is exactly the same as encryption. And cipher feedback mode amounts to the same way. Um, like OFB mode, you're just going to create a pattern of uh, semi-random bits and XOR them in. The only difference is exactly where you go to get the bit that you add to the next one. This one, you include the plain text, XOR it in. So it amounts, for all practical purposes, it's about the same. And it has the result that you do not need to fill the blocks, and it undoes itself. Well, I think this one, the, the decryption has to be a little bit different, but it doesn't really matter that much. All right, and then there's counter mode. And the simplest version of counter mode, now you're just going to have a different IV for every block that does not come from the encryption of the previous block. It follows some kind of pattern. In the simplest mode, you just put one on the first block, two on the first block, three on the third block. Um, this one can be parallelized because you do not need to do block one before you do block two. You have a stream of IVs that are created with something like a pseudo-random generator, so you can create them all in advance and then encrypt it all at once. So that's a good thing. You're feeding in a counter, a nonce in the counter, nonce in the counter, and on you go. Uh, one common way you do it is you choose a random notch that is some of the bits, and then you choose some of the bits to just count. So you can very quickly create a chain of numbers here that are unpredictable and easy to create. That's one way to do it. Um, and again, it has the property that the operation on the plain text is just XOR. So you don't need to fill the box. All right, and decryption is the same as encryption because you just XOR and you just create the same stream of pseudo-random bits and XOR them to, de to decrypt it. So, I got some cahoots about that stuff. So, 
They go running away, all right? Who knows? Uh, my cahoots, all right. Yeah, fear of cahoot, anyways. Or perhaps they're running off to conspire and cheat on the cahoots. It's hard to tell, anyway. <laughs> they could be. That's why these things are extra credit. They're not like all that secure. Like I thought, online is a popular way to attend the class. Okay, so there it is, 738-540. Well, I don't really need to balance. Oh, that's right, I just took a trip. Clean up my back. Dangerous move. Ah, someone left paper in here. Life is good. All right. All right, so 16 players. I'll wait a few more seconds and see if somebody else is coming. Four, five, okay. All right. Alice text Bob using symmetric encryption. Wait a minute, this is the wrong one. All right, forget that one. That's next week. Let's try the right chapter. There we are, 5A, good, thank you. It ought to have some resemblance to the lesson, otherwise it's a little dying. Let's try this one. All right. That's what I get for planning ahead. Just confuses me. <coughs> Okay, let's see if this one looks like the right stuff. Block ciphers, that's a better start. Okay, 528, 920. All right. All right, I'll wait another five seconds. Three. All right. Looks like everyone's aboard that's coming aboard. All right. Let's see if this looks better. What mode encrypts every block in the same manner? That sounds like the right questions. Okay, ECB, good, a popular answer. Which mode can be calculated on a parallel system? All right, and that is counter mode, CBC cannot, you have to do one block or you next, but counter mode, you can predict all the nonces before you start, so you don't need to wait. All the rest of these take the first block to predict the next, to incorporate in the next block, so that follows up parallel calculation. Which mode requires padding? Okay, CBC. Wait, oh, ECB. Yeah, that's right. I thought CBC did too. Uh, that's not a very good question. I wonder if there's a way to not count it. I think there's not. Well, that's why these things are extra credit. That's kind of unfair. I have two good answers. CBC does require padding, and ECB requires padding. How annoying. I don't know how to cancel it. We will just move forward regardless. All right. Uh, which mode works best over noisy channels? Okay, and on those, ECB will work best because the others all have one block depend on another. ECB does not. 
so the blocks that don't get noise in them will work. All right, forward we go. Which mode works even if the blocks arrive out of order? Okay, and that's uh, electronic code book, that's correct, because the block can be out of order and it doesn't matter. All right, well, this imperfect system has nevertheless picked three people to win, although one of them has no name, <laughs> reflecting a few, oh, Ardugan, Ardugan is somehow discriminated in the name thing. And Archim, hey, I know who these people are, this is great. It does make it easy, all right. So. All right, hopefully the next one will be more accurate, such as life. I'm going to stop and restart the Zoom for the next bit of the lecture because it's going to time out in a few minutes. So stop share. So ECB works for both noise and automation? Yes, because it's just very simple. Every block of input is separate.